Holy crap. I can't believe it. I can't believe that I am going to say this. I can't believe that it has come to this point. You already know what I am about to say due to the title of this video, but I will say it anyway for clarity. And I will elaborate. The Mandalorian is better than the current Star Wars sequel trilogy. I would even say that Mandalorian, the Mandalorian is better than nearly every single Star Wars movie that has come out since 2015. Typically, when you have a TV show that's based on a movie, that's a loose adaptation of a movie, or that exists in a movie universe, typically it is of lower quality, the storytelling is dragged out and not as interesting. There's only one exception other than The Mandalorian that I can think of, and in this case, it would be Daredevil on the, the Netflix series that is now cancelled after season 3 with that cliffhanger, unfortunately. Um, Daredevil is absolutely amazing. I think it is the only Marvel TV show that is on par with the rest of the MCU. It is the pinnacle of what TV can be in a universe related to awesome movies or a shared universe that um, exists between movies and TV shows other than that TV show spin-offs or any shared universe TV show kind of sucks but in this case the shared universe of the Star Wars universe this particular TV show the Mandalorian is so much better in my opinion than the sequel trilogy now let me be clear and specify make sure that there's no confusion. The Star Wars sequel trilogy by far has superior special effects due to the fact that it's going to make a lot more money within those two hours than The Mandalorian ever will due to the fact that The Mandalorian will never be shown on a movie theater projector with people eating popcorn and drinking soda in movie theater seats. It's not going to be mixed to have its audio go through a movie theater so the visual effects aren't going to be on par however for a TV show which obviously is gonna use a lot of CGI Disney Plus knocked it out of the park with the Mandalorian the Mandalorian is believable you can tell that it's a TV show that it's not a movie but it looks better than B-movies that have CGI. It looks better than a lot of Hollywood movies that use CGI. And you know that they used a lot of CGI in this movie. And obviously a lot of practical effects. The special effects in this movie are better than the Star Wars prequel, prequel trilogy. And I would say they're on par, if not better, than the original trilogy. The Mandalorian is significantly more competent than the prequel trilogy. And obviously, the technology we have available to do special effects, both practical and digital, is far more superior than what it was during the days of the original trilogy. So obviously, those special effects are going to look good. But for a TV show that takes place in outer space and has different effects for outer space. I, I'm going, I'm thinking, you know, of all the Star Trek shows, The Expanse, Firefly, I'm thinking of all these shows that do take place in outer space, and then I'm thinking of B-movies that take place in outer space or try to do any sort of special effect. I'm thinking of Netflix originals, which have a, a drastically different environment than, uh, you know, our day-to-day -day lives. This looks so much better than all of that. There wasn't a single special effect that I found unbelievable. I believed that these are tangible environments. I believed these were tangible sets. I believed they were tangible creatures. And I believed that the effects were, were happening. I, I believed what was happening. Again, obviously you can tell it's you know TV show quality. But TV is definitely going up as far as quality goes. And that's amazing and I'm glad to see that. How amazing would it be if TV shows 10 years from now are better quality than, or are equal to quality visually and effects-wise as something like the Star Wars 
sequel trilogy. Now, let me get on with my point. The Mandalorian is better than the sequel trilogy. Dave Filoni and, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on his name. The guy who is in charge of the MCU. Dave Favreau? I might have gotten their names mixed up. Anyway, these people, they know what they're doing. They know what they are doing, and I am so glad that they're in charge of it. And J.J. Abrams and Kathleen Kennedy are not in charge of The Mandalorian. The Mandalorian is an original story as far as canon goes, and as far as what we've seen compared to on screen. Now, Disney, I think, hit it out of the park with The Force Awakens. There are flaws with that movie that I have... I have my grievances with it, but for the most part, it's a visually beautiful movie. There are interesting plot points. Sure, Rey is a Mary Sue, but it wasn't as egregious as it was in The Last Jedi. I felt like The Force Awakens had the potential to be something amazing, but in a uh, typical J.J. Abrams fashion and Kathleen, Ke Kathleen Kennedy not being a competent leader, there was no plan set in motion. And the fact that they completely went from J.J. Abrams to Ryan Johnson having full Ryan Johnson having full control, a completely different person working on the sequel to what is supposed to be a connected linear trilogy. That's how you drop the ball, and that's why I think the sequel trilogy is failing. Two different visions creating movies that can pretty much stand alone. The The Force Awakens Episode Seven, Star Wars. First movie in the sequel trilogy was a fun nostalgia trip. It wasn't an original story, but it had some decent plot points. We, as far as Rey went, we had no idea what her lineage was. Now, it wasn't she wasn't an original character in the sense that she's basically a Luke Skywalker clone, in a sense. However, with Luke, we understood that he lived with his aunt and uncle. What separates Rey from Luke is that she was on her own. She's still a bit of a Mary Sue, but I was okay. I, I, lo I looked past that. Finn, I thought, had an interesting backstory because in the Star Wars movies, we haven't seen a stormtrooper defect from the Empire. And to me, that had some awesome potential dramatic impact. Like, there was a lot of potential there. But The Last Jedi dropped the ball. So there was a lot of stuff set down in motion, and The Force Awakens was competent, it was great, most people agree it was a great movie, however I think the reputation of The Force Awakens will be tainted due to The Last Jedi, and The Last Jedi is nowhere near Empire. Nobody's gonna look back at The Last Jedi and say, wow, that was such a good movie, the same way that people did with Empire Strikes Back. It's not going to happen. Now, let me tell you, I was super excited, finally, we have a Star Wars movie after almost... A decade, if not more than a decade. I think it was, yeah, more than a decade. Finally, we get a Star Wars movie. I was excited. It was a, a nostalgia trip. And then Rogue One comes out. And that movie had its flaws, but it showed potential of what the anthology films and what the future of Star Wars could be. Competent movies. Movies that are different from the rest. Rogue One was a basically military movie in a way. Like a, like a squadron military unit infiltrating a base and stealing information it was fucking awesome in the end you had some darth vader nostalgia you saw darth vader on the big screen in a way that you've always imagined he would be you saw him in a way that you might not have known you wanted to see him in if you're a casual star wars fan it was awesome the ending of rogue one was awesome now the major flaw of rogue one which I was able to look past due to the competency of Rogue One, and this might be, this might stem from the rewrites and reshoots that Rogue One went through. However, it was still it was still an okay movie. There was a disconnect between me and the characters. I felt like there wasn't anything for me to latch on to, and really care about the characters. I thought Jen Erso was a pretty decent character. I didn't hate her, and I didn't think that she was OP. Um, she was relatable in the Star Wars universe because she was an ordinary person to an extent. I liked the whole Death Star plot point that they put in that movie. And I found the blind guy whose name I can't remember because, you know, none the characters, while being memorable, aren't memorable to the same extent as the characters in the original trilogy. But the blind guy was really interesting to me. And I, I actually hated that he died. Spoiler alert. 
And then the trailer for The Last Jedi drops, and I see the trailer. Holy crap, this is fucking awesome. This is going to be so cool. The trailer got me excited. I went to the theater, saw The Last Jedi. I was disappointed. I went and saw it with my girlfriend. And then, at the time, my girlfriend at the time. And then, I wanted, I was so confused, I felt indifferent. I didn't hate it, I didn't like it, I was disappointed. There was some bits that made me laugh. But the bits that made me laugh were bits that I didn't like. I mean, it was funny, because like, holy shit, did I just see that? Or, it was genuinely funny. But, I didn't like it, because it's not what I wanted. And it's not that the movie subverted my expectations. It did subvert my expectations, but it didn't do it in a good way, because nothing paid off, and it did not make sense. It was not a linear progression from the first movie of what was set up. I'm okay with having my expectations subverted. I am 100% okay with having twists. But there's a way to do it that's not insulting to the audience, that doesn't completely blow anticipation out of the water in a negative way. So I went back and I sh- I, you know, I had my mom watch it and was with my girlfriend again. I saw it for the second time. And then that's when I realized I hated this fucking movie. I hated The Last Jedi. It's the only Star Wars movie that I absolutely hate. And I had to buy it because I need to own every Star Wars movie. Because, you know, that, that that's my thing. I need to own every episodic Star Wars movie, including the anthology films. Say what you want about the prequel trilogies, but at least the prequel trilogies had redeeming qualities. The sequel trilogy, Episode 7 had redeeming qualities. Rogue One had redeeming qualities. The Last Jedi shit on the legacy of the original trilogy. Now, The Force Awakens pissed on the legacy of the original trilogy, but I was okay with it because it felt like it was going somewhere. I I understood the progression. It didn't pee on it. It it slapped. It it, it slapped the original trilogy. It didn't piss on it. The Last Jedi skipped peeing on the original trilogy. It took a hot, steaming pile of diarrhea shit on the original trilogy, ruined its legacy, and I'm holding out on episode 9. The trailer for episode 9 looked really underwhelming. But there were a lot of stuff in, there was a lot of stuff that I saw in the trailer that looks exciting, but just hear me out, just do this real quick. Watch the episode 7 trailer, watch the Last Jedi trailer, episode 8, and then watch episode 9's trailer. Completely, completely underwhelming trailer in comparison. I don't know what to expect, however I feel like there is a potential for them to drop the ball even further. Not just drop, uh, not even drop the ball. Fucking pick six, boy. (laughs) And completely just not shit on the legacy of the original trilogy, but make the original trilogy's legacy completely irrelevant and non-existent at all. That's what I feel, if this plot point goes through, that's what I feel like is going to happen. But let me move on. I hated it, but I saw the trailer for Solo, and I thought the Solo trailer was underwhelming. Again, I was used to the Force Awakens trailer, the Last Jedi trailer, Rogue One trailer, but as I learned from The Last Jedi, you can't always trust the trailer. But the trailer for Solo looked interesting enough that, I, you know, I, I wanted to watch it. It was exciting, but also I just had everything ruined from The Last Jedi. It, I hated it that much. I went and saw Solo. And I actually kind of liked it. Even they went through reshoots, they reshot pretty much after 80% of the movie was done, they fired the director, they hired a new director, and he rewrote some of the script, and then they re- did reshoots. And you can kind of tell that there were some reshoots, but I liked Solo. It was a fun movie. It was a really fun movie. It was a competent movie. Even if you can't accept Holo that's not played by Harrison Ford, it was a fun, self-contained movie. The actors were good. The droids were funny. The car- Lando was a was awesome. Donald Glover played a perfect Lando, in my opinion. I liked it. I didn't think it ruined or shit on the legacy of Rogue One. But, yeah, no, that's it. However, I feel like The Last Jedi ruined the beauty that was Solo, unfortunately. Uh, most of the criticisms about Solo that I've seen are nitpicks. And most people who have reviewed that movie, I think, are retards. And I'm not saying that just because we disagree. I'm saying that because of the nature of their criticism. 
Hey, if you can't talk about Solo on its own without bringing up The Last Jedi, then I think you're an idiot. You're not looking at it objectively. And if you don't think Solo is a great movie, that's fine. I understand that. But Solo is not a bad movie. It was a box office bomb, probably because of The Last Jedi. And The Last Jedi sucked. But this is when we get The Mandalorian. This is what the sequel trilogy should have been. We get an original story, not a rehash. Right? If this this is the way I look at it. I'm going to do a little analogy. This is like your varsity high school football team getting completely fucking dominated. But your JV plays the same town that week and they completely fucking annihilated the team that just dominated your varsity. That's the Mandalorian in the sequel trilogy so far as I see it. Or you you throw no, that, I mean, that analogy is good enough. I don't need to come up with another analogy. The Mandalorian's story isn't a rehash of something we've already seen. And I'm all cool with rehashed stories and stories written for nostalgia reasons because I was on board with The Force Awakens and was excited going into The Last Jedi. I was perfectly fine with it until I saw The Last Jedi. But The Mandalorian, it's offering something new. I wish The Mandalorian was an anthology film because that's how invested I am with the story and how I want to see it pan out on a big fucking screen. But I didn't. we didn't get that. And it's sad. The Mandalorian manages to be better than the sequel trilogy despite not knowing the name of the main character. Not only do you not know the name of the main character, you don't even know what the main character looks like. I mean, unless you, you know the actor who plays the Mandalorian, then you have an idea of what the Mandalorian looks like. But we haven't seen the character's face. And yet we, we tend to know through acting and and body motion, and not a whole lot of dialogue, we tend to know exactly how the Mandalorian is feeling, we tend to know what he's thinking, we're able to predict what he's going to do, and in some way we're able to project ourselves into this badass bounty hunter. And it's interesting because bounty hunters, especially Mandalorians, are warriors, but there's a sort of empathetic streak to them. And listen, this is a lot more, let's be clear, this is a lot more that I could say about the characters in the sequel trilogy. The only one who I find mildly interesting at this point is Fenn. And his whole character development and his whole character arc and plot, I think, was shit on in The Last Jedi. But regardless, well, not regardless, the Mandalorian, the main character, let me just reiterate this. We haven't seen his face, we don't know his name... But he's a badass. We care about him. And we understand what he's thinking in a particular moment. Because the direction of the show, the actor, it's so amazing, it works. And that is so fucking awesome to see. There's another main character. It's uh, it's being called Baby Yoda. We don't know his name. We don't know anything about Baby Yoda. But we, but we care about Baby Yoda. It's adorable to see... Baby Yoda. It's not actually Yoda as a baby, but it's the same species as Yoda as a baby. And there's this dynamic between Baby Yoda and the Mandalorian. Again, both characters, we have no idea who they are. We have no idea what their names are. But there's this bond between Baby Yoda and the Mandalorian. And the way the plot plays out, so far only three episodes in. And these episodes are really taking their time. And let me be clear, these episodes have very little dialogue compared to the, compared to the sequel trilogy and the anthology films. And it manages to be better because they're they're competent with the story that they're setting up, they're competent with the emotions, they're competent with the set pieces, and when it comes together, it is amazing. It is perfect. There's not many TV shows that I think are absolutely fucking perfect. I think The Walking Dead Season 1 is perfect. The Walking Dead Season 3 and Season 4, in my opinion, are perfect. I think Jericho is a about as perfect of, of a show as you can get with uh, uh, primetime television. 
CBS television, especially back in 2005 and 2007. Daredevil is about as perfect of a show as you can get in relation to the MCU. We'll see what Disney Plus has to offer, but so far with The Mandalorian, Disney Plus is, is really impressive. This is the Star Wars sequel trilogy we should have gotten. The fact that The Mandalorian is able to create more interesting characters than the sequel trilogy without you knowing anything about them other than The Mandalorian, that he's a Mandalorian, he's a bounty hunter, you don't know what he looks like. You don't know the facial expressions he's making. But you understand him through the acting, through the direction, through the cinematography. There's some cool, awesome set pieces in this move, in this show. The shootouts are awesome. It feels like a f awesome western. You you feel the struggle. There's several different environments. Like there's so far, we've seen mostly, like, dry environments, but even though there's dry environments, it seems like there's quite a bit of variety. Like, I think we've only really seen, I'm trying to remember, we've only really seen desert planets, but the set pieces on these desert planets have variety, so it's amazing. You see a really awesome canyon, a really dried out location with deep, deep cracks, you get a cave, you get a village, you get a, a, a bigger town, <clears throat> you see a few different bars, you see the underground of where the Mandalorians are, you see believable creatures in their natural environment, you, you see the way that the Empire has sort of uh, uh, spread out in a way, and how there's different little groups and factions who are obviously still loyal to the idea of the Empire, but there's no centralized power structure, so they are so decentralized to the point where it's just little factions, little groups. And I'm already interested. It, the plot is so simple, but there's so much for it to offer, and there's so much they can do with it, that I'm excited to see what happens. I have nothing negative to say about The Mandalorian, other than I wish it could be on the big screen. That's about the only criticism I have, and that's not even a criticism. But the sequel trilogy... I could point to several several different things. Ray is a is she is a Mary Sue. There's there's some defense of her being a Mary Sue that says, well, so what? Did you enjoy the movie? Yeah, I enjoyed The Force Awakens. Hated The Last Jedi. The Last Jedi would have been better if she wasn't a Mary Sue. That's a huge problem. I'm not going on a journey with this character. I'm just watching this perfect person go through everything almost perfectly. The trials and tribulations that Ray goes through as a character, is uninteresting because I figure that she's going to be okay. When I watched the original trilogy, Luke, he wasn't a perfect person. But the thing is, is you can have an awesome character who's a badass and who's competent at things, but still have them grow. Like, when we see Luke in the original trilogy, we know he's a decent, a really good pilot, and he probably got that from his dad. We know there's some sort of natural connection with the Force. So he's not useless. He's not a bumbling idiot. I'm not talking about making your character an underdog. You don't need to do that. Which is why I looked past the Mary Sue elements in The Force Awakens because it was explainable. She was on a desert planet. She became self-sufficient in uh, me melee combat. Melee combat. Me melee? Whatever. Melee <laughs> combat with uh, her staff. So it was believable that she could competently use a lightsaber for the most part. And that she had the dexterity and the finesse to stand up to somebody. So I was okay with that. But with Luke, again, even he's not an idiot. He's competent. He's accurate with firearms. Because he can shoot womp rats. <laughs> that was a line from The Force Awakens. Before they attack, not The Force Awakens, uh, A New Hope before they attack the Death Star. I'm a nerd, I know. But again, there was still a character progression because, sure, Luke was competent and he was skilled, but he wasn't competent and skilled enough, and he didn't have this a solid foundation in his personal fortitude to face the Empire, let alone Darth Vader. In the fifth movie, he's a little more competent, but he was tricked into believing that he was more skilled and ready when he actually wasn't. He wasn't ready, so he went in and faced the Empire, and he suffered the consequences 
of fighting Darth Vader. He was injured, he lost his hand, and now he has to have a robotic hand. Now you could say that, well, they they basically got rid of the, the consequence of him losing his hand by giving him a an automated, a, ro- a robot hand, a prosthetic. But that's still a consequence. It doesn't feel good to get your fucking hand cut off. And he lost organic tissue. I would rather have a real hand as opposed to a Cybertronic hand. You know, you know what I mean? And that's still a consequence. He, su- he almost died and he found out something really dark he got his ass handed to him you know he really fought for his life and that's because he was cocky and went in by the time episode six comes around he is ready he but he still goes through trials and tribulations due to the fact that that's how conflict works at this point he's maybe equal to what we assume is the main villain of the original trilogy so it's not easy but he's competent enough to do it and he has enough personal and uh, competent fortitude to do what needs to be done and make rational decisions as well. And even then, he's still vulnerable. And that's why we care about him. That's why he's interesting. Because we know he's not terrible. We know he's not stupid. We know he's not weak. But it doesn't mean everything comes easily to him. And that's what makes us care about the character and actually find an interest in him. Because he, he's relatable, but he's also a badass. Ray's not that. Finn, again, had interesting... He, he, he was a deserter. He was a coward in The Force Awakens. Towards the end of that, he wasn't a coward anymore. He, he finally, seemingly, found his northern star and was going to follow it. And in The Last Jedi, it becomes muddled. At least in The Mandalorian, it's... Very clear that we have this bounty hunter who is a warrior, who is ruthless, and who will kill people for money or for a medal for his armor. But we understand one particular thing about him. He might be ruthless. He might be, I guess in some way, evil or your worst nightmare. Or indifferent. Not evil, but indifferent to your life if he's paid to kill you. But he has a conscience. A conscience. And that's what I really like is... Him having a conscience, they weren't afraid to give him some sort of morality to stand on, despite not being a moral person. But it didn't undermine the tenets that were set up as his character, because he's still a badass. The way he showed his morality was ruthless, in a way. He he made a decision between this particular life form, which you can say was it an organic life form, and of course, this little organic life form which is in some way defenseless but not entirely and he does show mercy to uh, a certain character after completely obliterating all of this character's allies or, or uh, uh, comrades or or friends or co-workers whatever whatever they were to him or his superiors just however the hierarchy is a uh, place and that's what makes me love The Mandalorian. It's just all the praise I can give the show, all the things I can say I like, all the all the good things I can point out. The fact that it doesn't need a lot of dialogue, I, I need to say this again, the fact that it doesn't need a lot of dialogue to be good is a testament to Dave Filoni. I think that's his name. And uh, I think it's Dave Favreau. John Favreau? I can't remember. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll issue a uh, Correct. Well, let me look it up real quick. It is Dave Filoni and, um, I think it's Favreau? John Favreau, okay, yeah. I don't know why I said Dave Favreau. Dave Filoni and John Favreau, they are so competent when it comes to The Mandalorian and in their own particular series that they could make a show that appeals to so many people while Kathleen Kennedy, J.J. Abrams, and Ryan Johnson make something that's so divisive that so many people hate and... That's really nothing but a retread, unfortunately, and that sucks. So those are my thoughts about this, about The Mandalorian being better than the sequel trilogy. It is by far better. Is it superior in the special effects aspect? No. But you can have all the polish, all the paint that you want, but it means nothing if it's not under competent story that you can actually get invested in. So... I guess in that way, the special effects are more properly utilized in The Mandalorian. Therefore, more impressive. I think that logic makes sense. Have a good day.